And I feel like there's always going to be a market moving macro economic thing happening out there. But what I personally care about is for the individual. How do you take what's happening in the world and see how it directly affects you? If prices are going up, that means your expenses are going up. And if your income is not going up, that means you need to check and say like, okay, maybe I need to reassess and reevaluate what I really need. Hi everyone and welcome back. I'm Beth Moorcraft, a reporter of MoneyWise, and today I am very excited to welcome Miss New Jersey USA for 2023, Derby Chikudi. Derby, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm super excited to be joining you this morning. So Derby is also an investment strategist at JP Morgan Private Bank, and together we are going to chat about how young Americans can be more intentional with their money, whether they're saving for big expenses, getting out of debt, or trying to start their investing journey to build wealth. Let's get started with your interesting story. In March this year, you were crowned Miss New Jersey USA for 2023, becoming the first Nigerian American to hold the title. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) But as I said, in your day job, you're all about investment strategy with a private bank. So tell us a bit about yourself and how you got to this point. Yeah, so the journey is definitely an interesting one. I was born in Dallas, Texas, raised in Nigeria, grew up there for like 16 years. Then I moved in 2015 for college to Kentucky. So I went to Berea College to study economics and business in the middle of nowhere. Um, I remember moving like over 6,000 miles at age 16 just to pursue this dream of mine. And I feel like just that act just showed how adventurous and risk um risk tolerant I was to really going into the unknown. And um, after college, one of the things I was thinking about is where I could learn um, from the best and also just gain experience. Because I feel like when we're in college, we are really obsessed about what we really want to do after college. When my perspective was more about like, it's a journey and the more gems you can pick up as you go, the better. And the more experiences and people you get exposed to, that makes the journey worthwhile. Mm -hmm. I did an internship at JP Morgan during my junior year, um, received a full-time offer back and returned in 2019. And in 2019, I had this conversation with myself when I was about to graduate. I said, hey, you know, you're about to move to New York, New Jersey um, to work at JP Morgan. But let's talk about yourself and what your interests are and the things that you do really well. And I came up with this whole thing about like when we're young, our parents see that we're good in certain areas or people around us see that we're very good in certain areas. So they push us in that direction. But as an economist by heart, I know that for everything you do, there's something you're not doing. So I challenged myself to do something outside my comfort zone. As you move to this next chapter of your life, try something different. And there there are a bunch of different things that I did. But one of them was seeing one of my friends who competed at Miss Nigeria USA in 2019, I think. And I was like, oh, that is a cool thing to do. And I wasn't really looking for like, oh, some serious competition. The whole mandate was put yourself out there, see what you do really well, see what you don't like, and just keep learning about yourself. And so I remember like researching, reaching out to that particular pageant my friend had done. They haven't had a pageant since 2019. They're just returning this year. So that didn't quite work out. Then I came across New York, USA. I didn't really know much about what that was. I, and I put in an application. But the directors are the same for New Jersey. So they say, hey, you live in Hoboken, New Jersey. We are moving your application to Jersey. And when we need new people to, con- um, to compete, we'll let you know. And I forgot about it. And then two years later, it comes up again in 2021. We're in the middle of a pandemic. We're working from home. Then I'm on the client side of the private bank. So working with different bankers and investors to take care of our clients. And this opportunity comes up again. And I do the interview with the organization. I love to speak. So that was just a fun process for me. But then I remember getting that invitation. Hey, you know, you're a state finalist. We'd like you to compete this year. And all I felt was like doubt. And I had, I kept hearing myself say, I cannot do this. I don't have the time. I'm working full time. And for me, that led me to a journey of discovery because when I delved down, I realized that it wasn't about I have a full time job or I'm too busy. It was more about fear because this was a different level of putting yourself out there. Now you're putting yourself in the public eye. People have opinions about you. And then I, I coined this whole um, theme about the colorful life. Like, what is the story going to be 15 years from now, 20 years from now? Will it be, oh, you know, in my 20s, I worked really hard, had a great time at JP Morgan, amazing colleagues. Or would it be 
oh, you know, I lived a colorful life, did different things. Yes, I had this great career, but here are the things I even found out about myself. That was more interesting to myself. And I said, hey, when we, what do we do with our fears? We run towards them, not away from them, because they keep following us anyway. So I competed in 2021. I prepared um, in a way that I thought was the right way in 2021. I reached out to people, learned about people's journeys, did everything I needed to do. And I went to compete. It was about 121 girls. And I did not place. But I did win the interview award which I, I felt was a source of encouragement that, oh, maybe um, you just need a little bit more push. But then when I look back on that journey, it was me just really putting myself on the Indian unknown, just the same way I came at age 16 to Kentucky to pursue a degree. This was just a different adventure. And fast forward, um, I took the year of 2022 to regroup, focus on other priorities like work, and I, I decided to come back again because what I realized was the journey was it was not a competition about who's the most beautiful or who's the smartest. It was a competition of about who knew who she was, who knew her journey, who embraced every aspect of her life. And I feel like that's all we're trying to always do from like our work, from like the relationships we have with family, friends, even with our money. So for me, I came back knowing, you know what, I know who I am and I know what value I bring to the table. And that is my only mandate to show that. And clearly the judges saw that. So that is how I got here um, today. Yeah, that's that's such an interesting story. Um, so many kind of, it seems you've learned so many lessons from doing the pageantry personally and professionally, which is just great to hear. Um, is there anything that you've taken away from your pageantry experience that you can apply to personal finance or that anyone can apply to personal finance and kind of managing money? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things about the um, pageantry world, it is expensive. But then I feel like that's that gives an opportunity to get scrappy. So I feel like I learned like scrapping as growing up, facing adversities. How do you ad- address challenges or show up every single day? And it's the same way, even though it's expensive, how do I leverage the skills I already got from work? So working with clients, you're learning how to pitch. You're always telling a story, you're always bringing solutions. How do you take the, the, take those skill sets? to pageantry and say like, you know what? Yes, this costs X amount of money. It doesn't mean you have to pay X amount of money. It means you can leverage just pitching skills and say like, here's how my exposure with your brand helps you. And that way it could lead to some negotiation. So I've been doing a lot of those things or sometimes I see a partnership opportunity and I'm able to tell the story of um, why they need to work with me or why this opportunity may be a good one or helping people also like see the value that their brands have. And I feel like that just helps me realize that you don't have to bring everything out of pocket. But then also pageantry makes you be intentional about your money, your budgeting and thinking about like, how do I save towards this big adventure? Meet Miss USA coming up. It's a lot of expenses. Some, you get some support from your price package, but you still have skin in the game, like the investors like to say. So how do you leverage um, all the value that you bring, the perspective that you have to really saying like, oh, how can I make this less financial, financially burdensome for me? And a lot of what I've used, honestly, is like pitching, being able to see like, here's the value of pageantry. Here's why you want to be part of this industry or connected to this industry. Because it also attaches a lot of other industries, like from the cosmetic world to the fashion world, to even coaching, life coaching, walking coaching. There's so many things attached to it where it's not just only pageantry. So that has been really helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And you now have this public platform as Miss New Jersey. You're competing at Miss USA in about a month's time. Um, One of your goals, as I understand it, is to try and kind of improve financial education among young Americans um, using this platform. I just wondered, what was your kind of financial education and financial literacy like when you were growing up? Mm -hmm. I think that's that's a great question. Um, Growing up, we didn't really talk about money like that. I knew knew about money, which is the crazy thing, which is why this advocacy is really important to me. Because we learn about money from a young age. It's just the question is, who do you learn it about from? And I mean, I knew that you had to pay bills, but then there was no direct teaching of like, here's what to do with money. So I also had an, a unique experience with my siblings where sometimes my mom will pay us for chores. And this is back in Nigeria, so it's like not even up to a dollar. But the whole idea was just like teaching you that dignity in every form of labor and every kind of work. So you, you don't have to look down on anybody depending on the work that you're doing. 
But then again, we never actively had conversations about, hey, this is what you should do with money. This is how you should think about money. But my mom did have some investment experience. So with the stock, she was a stockbroker. So that kind of like influenced a little bit. Then for me, just seeing how life played out, I always started picking up things like, hey, you know, you want to have funds for rainy days. You never know what that looks like. And as a kid, that didn't mean like a lot of money. It meant like, hey, if I need to buy some phone credits, because we use credits back in Nigeria to make a phone call, I want to make sure that I'm not using up my credits or I have some just in case there's an emergency. So I started picking up those skills growing up. And I remember going into college, I got some funds, like monetary gifts, and I saved that. Because I was like, hey, you know, I don't have allowances. I didn't have that. And even if like anybody in my family wanted to support, I'm like, hey, you guys have your um, priorities to really focus on. They're actually more important. I'm going to figure out life on my own. And so I saved that. I remember that monetary gift I got when I first came to the U.S. It was probably still available a year later. Then I started learning about Robinhood, the app where you could buy like $5 of Amazon and all the shares that were interesting. So I started um, buying some of those stocks that I could relate to. It could be a Macy's, it could be um, Nike too. So there's some stocks like that. That was just me teaching myself. And then, and I remember it's some actually a defining summer. There was a summer where I was moving to a different state for the internship. That was my first summer internship. Had no allowances yet because we had to wait two weeks before we got paid our first paycheck. And I did have a credit card then. It was like $650 credit limit. And I remember like, because I had to move, make some purchases, everything valid and warranted, no excessive spending here. Everything was maxed out. And I remember I couldn't pay my phone bill for the first time ever. As, and then I was a sophomore. It was the most stressful experience ever. And I just remember telling myself like, hey, I never want to experience this again. You know, I don't know what this is. And I know like everything that led me here was valid. And this was just like temporary because we were going to get paid like in a few days. But that whole experience was just like a solid reminder that, hey, you can't, you need to take care of your finances. You need to be intentional about it. So the experience I've had with finance, um, financial like literacy have been life you know, experiences, self-teaching, having those experiences and saying, what can I learn and apply um, to those things and keeping that going. And that's helped me even like create like my money rules, which I'm sure you've heard about my money rules. And a lot of those things is just a personal journey. And there are questions about like, what kind of life do you want to live? What kind of like um, experiences do you want to have? What are your priorities? And that's also what's going to like shape what I spend my money on or how I think about my money. Mm -hmm. That credit card story, I think is really important in the context of today, um, because I'll just get this stat up, but credit card debt levels have surpassed by have surpassed one trillion dollars um, for the first time, and you know a lot of those people are young Americans trying to make their way. They're at college, maybe in their first job, saving for a house. The list goes on. Yeah. It's really challenging. Um, what advice do you perhaps have for people? on how to kind of work their way out of debt, but still enjoy, as you put it, kind of a colorful life. Yeah. So I think I think the biggest thing is to lay out everything on the table and just see like, what do I own? What don't I own? Because a lot of times there's also that misconception of assets. Some people hear assets and they're like, oh, this is what I own, like clothes and cars and stuff. And it's like, no, that is not what you own. But just seeing like, what do I own? And most times that may look like, oh, I own nothing because everything I own is losing value by every single day as each day passes. But one of the things I, that really helped me in my financial journey was reading books. I read tons of books. And one of them, I think David Ramsey is well known for his um, books, for his teachings and stuff like that. And he has this whole, I think, I can't remember what it's called, but it's kind of like a py pyramid to like, how to grow out of, grow into wealth or the steps. And one of these main steps is like pay down any debt, especially the high interest yielding debt. And a lot of that is credit cards. Sometimes it's very, people, I think we ignore how expensive it is to finance credit cards or if you're not meeting your payments, even if you're meeting the minimum payments, you're still getting, you're still paying extra. And realizing that, oh, you know, identifying what those debts are and coming up with a plan. And it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm going to pay everything all at once. It's like baby steps. 
that's the thing about the same way it takes baby steps to save. And before you know, you've saved twenty thousand dollars. It's the same way it takes baby steps to pay down those debts. And before you know, you're done. Like coming up with a plan and saying, well, what makes the most sense? Maybe it's two hundred dollars every month towards my two thousand dollars credit card bill. And then when you move from there, you can say like, okay, maybe the next step for me is um, an emergency fund. An emergency fund for anything that may come up. And that varies depending on where you are. For me, maybe like three to six months of monthly expenses. So that way, if something comes up, I know that I can still take care of myself for three to six months without sweating it before I start sweating it. Hopefully, whatever comes up is done by then. So that's where I'll, I'll tell people, like, look at the statements, pay attention. Like, what is also going into my debt? Some of it is um, is college college debt from like going to school, and that's different. I'm finding ways to like having a plan. I remember a friend of mine. One of the goals he had was to pay down his debt within like two years after graduating, and that meant like, oh, you know, I have limited expenses to make on the weekends because I really need to get this debt out of the way. Because once I get that out of the way, maybe I can think about things like owning a home. But until I do that, which is a wise thing, I may not be able to own that home. Because I think the other misconception a lot of young people are seeing in these days, people want to invest right away. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm always like, hey, if you don't have emergency funds, like it is not wise to put your rent money in the stock market. Anyway, because that is not the point. It's like there's there are different steps. You can't jump steps just because you want to see quick results. Yeah. Yeah. So the investing part is interesting, as you said, because there's a lot of... There's a lot of noise out there that influences young people and how they start investing, what they invest in, what kind of strategies they use, et cetera. There's a lot of just influence out there. Yeah. Um, so there was a, there was some research recently by the CFA Institute, which found that four and five Gen Z investors, they're kind of like the people at the very beginning of their journey at the moment, uh, they say they began investing before they turned 21, which um, is quite young. And 41% said that FOMO or fear of missing out was a factor in why they started investing. Um, so, you know, what do you think about that idea? And why would you encourage young Americans to kind of start their investing journey? I think I think knowing why you're studying is important. And then one of the things I find really profound, I think Kobe, Kobe once said it, he said, know what you're investing in, know what you're buying. At the end of the day, we're buying and selling. And I tell people, it doesn't always have to be the stock market. You could be talking to somebody, you may be selling a story. They're like buying what you're saying. If you don't know what you're, what you're trying to buy, then don't do it. So that's why I feel like financial education, because when I think about financial literacy, it's not just really about like saving, budgeting. It's a lot about the mindset too, like what limiting beliefs do you have? But then it's also like, why is this important? So part of one of the um, things I spend my time doing is volunteering. And we actually partner here at JP Morgan with the Fellowship Institute. And it's focused on um, high school diverse kids to just let them know about opportunities in the finance space. We do some investment simulator game just to show them like, hey, you know, here's how you think about investing. If you want to buy this stock, a lot of what we do there, we're not, we're not giving you like, we're not saying like, oh, you buy this, this is what you get. We never guarantee any results, but it's more about training the mindset. Like you have to do research. You have to understand if you like Google, why do you like Google? Why do you think Google is going to outperform? Because at the end of the day, you have to have a view of what's going to happen and say like, you know what? I really like Nike. I use all Nike products. I think they're going to be the next big thing, even in the next 20 years. And I'm putting my dollar in it. And I feel like a lot of times that's where that whole delayed gratification may not really exist in my generation. And it's telling people, like, take a step back, learn, research. At the end of the day, the goal, obviously, also in investing, everybody has different goals. So you can go in because of FOMO. What is your goal? If your goal is to be invested for a long term, then you don't want to go in because of FOMO. You want to understand what you're doing because that's what's going to sustain you long term because there's always hype everywhere. And if you buy into hype, the hype dies down. That may not make a good decision. Yeah. So one of the other stats in the study is that um, a large percentage, more than two in five, start with crypto, which I find <laughs> really interesting because you know, I'm I'm towards the beginning of that journey, and I just crypto's kind of scares me. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so, I mean, is that somewhat something like that might be from influence that they've had online, social media, etc.? It's a 
a sexy topic. Um, what do you yeah. think, kind of starting with crypto, um, does the advice differ from what you just said about understanding the asset? I think it's, you need to understand. You need to understand what it is, and I feel like when you understand and educate yourself on it, then you make a decision, and you own that decision too. And again, it's like there's so much hype everywhere, and again with the influencing, social media hype sells. So reminding people that the fundamentals you want to remember, like the fundamentals of like why am I even thinking about investing or even learning about this stuff? What do I want to gain? And a lot of times when you take the time to uncover all of those deep um, foundations and you may, you may realize like, oh, this is so hype. There's nothing much in there or this is not. So I think the advice is the same. Yeah. Don't just go in because of FOMO or because of hype. Go in because you understand. Yeah, the, <laughs> the FOMO bit was interesting. Um, so one other thing to consider, I guess, with this investing topic is just kind of the state of the economy and returns, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of scary headlines in the news, you know, inflation, potentially going into recession, interest rates up again, et cetera. There's a lot of uh, negative energy. <laughs> so, you know, how would um how do how can kind of young people pick that apart and make sense of where we're at and, and sort of what do you see at the moment from uh, from your view at JP Morgan? I think um just speaking personally, I think there's always going to be something happening in the markets, which is why um, it's important to pay attention and try to understand like what is important, what is not. And you get to understand that by reading like research out there, papers, organizations like JP Morgan and other financial institutions always have a view of what they think. At the end of the day, no one really knows. But I think if anything, it calls that to attention to pay attention to what is happening in the world and how does that affect you? So I think with the inflation beat, a lot of us saw like prices rising of regular goods that we bought. And people even made jokes about it, like, oh my God, eggs are now $5 and things like that. But then I think that just calls us back to reassess and say like, okay, how does this affect my financial approach for my own balance sheet? Not knowing that everybody's balance sheet, especially young people, is probably much smaller and saying like, oh, well, do I need to reassess certain habits? Maybe I need to consider going out less or spending more, um, spending less on eating out and making things work. Because again, it goes back to what is your goal? Where are you? Being honest about like where you are and where you're trying to go. And I feel like there's always going to be a market moving macro economic thing happening out there. But what I personally care about is for the individual. How do you take what's happening in the world and see how it directly affects you. If prices are going up, that means your expenses are going up. And if your income is not going up, that means you need to check and say like, okay, maybe I need to reassess and reevaluate what I really need. And that's where we go to the basics of needs and wants. What are your needs? What are your wants? What do you need to cut down? Maybe you don't need to cut down. Maybe you need to get a better paying job. So making those decisions by yourself, I think is critical. Because I feel like, that is when the economy comes to life in our personal world, when we're able to tie it back and say, like, this is how inflation, this is how the Fed hikes really affects me as an individual. Mm -hmm. So sometimes young people invest or they start investing because they have this idea that they want to grow wealth that they can mm -hmm. then use for big things. You know, we've talked already about maybe buying a home. Um, yeah. What is that a good strategy kind of behind investing, almost like using investing as a way to build your savings? Well, I think at the end of it, again, the way I think about it is people use money for different things. It could be spending, saving, philanthropy, giving away to like other generations. And it takes time. I feel, I feel like that's something young people are learning every single day. Like you don't just wake up tomorrow and you become a millionaire, a billionaire. I mean, you could if you win the lottery, but without that, like it takes time. And I feel like it all goes back to what are your personal goals yeah. and what is your time horizon? Because again, markets go up and down. So you can't depend on, okay, this is my investment is going to achieve this goal, but you want to position your, your investments, the decisions you're making towards the goals that you're setting. So I think, again, it goes back to the goal goals and the time horizon and knowing that it takes time, but the long-term approach is always a good thing. But again, if I want to be a philanthropist or um, give to charities I care about, 
I shouldn't wait until I build wealth. So that's the other thing. How do you already live the life that you want without saying, oh, I'm going to wait 30 years and I'm going to start living? So if I want to really give back, maybe I'm giving back hours. Maybe I'm giving back X amount of dollars in every paycheck, making it a lifestyle. And as your wealth grows, that number increases. So you're not waiting for this one thing to happen for you to do the other thing, because usually th that doesn't work. Yeah. You already start from what you have, using what you have to do the things that you want to do, knowing that there's going to be a future, hopefully, where you have more and you can expand that reach. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That's really um, interesting advice there. I think we have time for one final quick question. So uh, there's a lot of influence today for young people on social media. Um, there's also that sort of influence, that same style in the world of pageantry too. Derby, I just wanted to ask you what you thought about kind of the idea of young people turning to social media sites like TikTok and Instagram as their sole point um, of information for financial literacy and advice? I think um, for such a critical topic as financial literacy, social media cannot be your sole source of information. I think about social media as a teaser and then you still got to go watch the full movie um, and you want to have different sources. Like hopefully we all wrote papers in college where you had to find different sources to either disprove or prove a point I think is the same thought process we should be having and you need to think about who is uh, well experienced in this space because social media you just get a part of the story you don't get the full story you get the headlines but you don't want to get you don't want to stop at the headlines especially if you're going to make a critical decision regarding your finances you want to go deep you want to understand certain things and then use that understanding to make a decision so yeah don't stop there do the research um, have a view so that when things also don't go well, depending on whatever decision you make, you can still say like, well, I learned something and here is why this didn't work out and it's okay. And you move on versus, oh, I took this from social media and okay, I guess I would try some other social media page. No, just stick with, stick with the facts, get the facts and use that to help you have a view on whatever it, whatever it is, regardless of whether that's saving, budgeting, investing, social media should not be your only source. Yeah. 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 Important note there. Um, Derby, thank you so much. I've certainly learned a lot from our discussion today and I'm sure that our viewers have too. Thank you so much. Um, it was a pleasure.